All right, rock. Uh, what's up, Defcon? How you doing? <laughs> um, so I have a little bit of a problem here. I can't see on my own laptop, so I'm going to be like walking back and forth, taking a peek at what my slides actually say, and then talking a little bit about them. Um, so my talk is uh, titled "Every Breath You Take." A lot of people in this track are talking about, um, you know, anonymity, privacy, hiding from the internet, more or less. Um, I take kind of a cynical approach to that. I don't think it's it's really possible, um, and in a way, I don't think it's so bad. You can do some useful things with it. So I'm going to go a bit into data gathering, analysis, and some other cool things you can do. So the main focus of my talk is just data everything, right, that you can possibly do. Um, so I'll walk through a little bit of what I mean by data. Like, you know, we're all smart people here that uh, have our own, um, you know, views of what, you know, you mean by data. It could be stuff over the network, stuff in... Uh, you know, the physical world, anything like that. Um, gathering, persistence, mirroring, analysis, and uh, like kind of forecasting, targeting what you can do with this data once you get it. So first of all, a quick little introduction. So uh, you know who I am. I'm Jim O'Leary, a.k.a. Jimmy O. Uh, <laughs> so I've been doing uh, security work for a while. I'm mostly a corporate, stiff, white hat guy. Um, I have undergrad background in comp sci and psych, so that's why I'm really interested in a lot of this human-computer interaction and what it means going forward. Um, and so I am employed. I'm not speaking on behalf of my employer right now, so anything I say is just going to get myself in trouble. Uh, and so a little story to get things started. Um, so we started off with this little picture of the world, right? I'd say that it doesn't matter if you're a creationist or like one of these science guys that's really hardcore. Uh, at some point, the world happened, right? And we're in it right now. Um, and there's this feedback loop that takes place to kind of maintain the um, systems that are going on in like, you know, the room you're in right now. Uh, and you just try to abstract it up to where you are, right? So you're in a room, you're in Vegas, you're in Nevada, you're in the United States, you're in the Earth, right? So the whole uh, scope of um, kind of like, you, it's just tough to appreciate, right? Like you can't grasp all this in one thought. Like everything that's going on right now, it's, it's just amazing. So eventually, right, depending again on your views, but you know, we showed up at some point and we're here right now. So the Earth, right, kind of spins that guy out. And now we have a, a feedback loop with our environment, right? So it's hot outside, you're sweating your balls off, right? Um, and you know, you start driving around in your car all the time, you end up with this global warming crap and, and all that stuff too. So, um, you know, like it or not, there, there's a feedback loop there. And uh, I'm also trying to introduce this guy. So um, this, this first guy actually could have just been life in general, right? Now we're uh, these, these higher intelligent beings, we're self-aware. So um, we can also do things to ourselves, right? And then uh, see how that uh, creates, oops, I'm going to trip over wires here. Um, see, you know, what kind of uh, situations those result in. So lastly, and I can just skip to my whole, like, big picture here, right? So we have computers, and everybody in this room works pretty closely with computers, probably spends, I don't know, say, like, eight hours a day at least on one. Um, and my whole talk here, right, is just trying to kind of bridge that, this whole loop together to do something useful, right? A lot of people are kind of scared, uh, for good reason, of the lines between the computer and the person, uh, because it usually is in a direct line, right? If you're doing something over the internet, there are millions of, well, not millions, but lots and lots of people that can potentially be looking at what you're doing. And even since you're working in their system that they define, like there's no way that they won't be able to know what you're doing, unless you make your own internet, I guess. Um, so. My data definition here, this is where I start off more on the physical kind of stuff, uh, is just everything that you can possibly gather, right? Uh, you can be like what time it is right now, where you're at, temperature, all this stuff. You can kind of read it, but you know, basically, I sum it up as just a bunch of stuff. And uh, it's, it is what it is. So on top of your data, you can also classify it into a bunch of different uh, classifications. So, this is just a really small subset, um, but some of which will be interesting to the security folks, right? We have your private data that um, you want to keep to yourself, public data you don't mind broadcasting, um, personally identifiable data, all this kind of stuff that you should be pretty familiar with already. Um, and this is when I may need to walk to see what my slides actually say. 
Um, so gathering is really you know, kind of observing this data and pulling it down and uh, getting yourself in a situation where you can actually do something with it. So there are a bunch of different uh, models for gathering this data. You know, like push is something proactive like email or um, you know, even in Twitter where you're like actually doing something to create the uh, transmission of data. Uh, pull is a little different, right? So it, when I want to check all my blogs, uh, I just go to you know, like Google Reader, check out everything everybody's pushed to me. Um, it's a little different. Voluntary and involuntary. Uh, so, like I said, any of these opt-in models, or it's like uh, Twitter. I send somebody a status update. Like I'm, I'm actually uh, volunteering into submitting this data. Um, the involuntary stuff gets interesting, right? This is where your ISP is sitting between um, all of your web requests and you, and they're looking at you know what you like to browse for, you know, um, so they can provide targeted ads or start selling your stuff. Um, that's when it gets a little interesting. The other interesting thing here is that um, a lot of systems, say like AOL Instant Messenger back in the day, and I think to this day, right, your status and profile are um, you know, just public all the time. And so most people don't really grasp that, right, because they have this notion of um, here are my buddies on my buddy list and these are the people that can talk to me. They don't also realize that uh, anybody can query this information and pull it down. Uh, so self-regulating, self-aware are more of like, you'll see this theme a bunch in my talk where I start writing down things that are bigger than I can actually uh, like appreciate. So those things are more just you know exercises left to the uh, mind of the reader. And then inadvertent is interesting. I think you'll see that as a pretty common theme and why I'm so hopeless that you can actually keep stuff private, um, right? You have the AOL data leakage thing, you have uh, was it like Lexus, Nexus? Pretty much anybody that does anything with your data is gonna lose it at some point. Um, and so, how this all started for me, and this is more the um, person to the computer line, is I got one of these scales about three years ago, and uh, it's pretty sweet, right? It does like your weight, your body fat. Uh, actually, my boy Vish right there had one back in college, and so it's kind of the inspiration. Um, but so it's, it's a pretty sweet little thing, right? You get an actual concrete number as to. Um, what you are pretty much at that point, right? It's not everything you are, but it's a measurable, um, you know, representation of self. So <coughs> that's cool. It can give you a snapshot of what you are like at any given time. Um, the more interesting thing is, right, when you start gathering this data. So um, for a while, I just had to be like, oh, look, I weigh like 100 something pounds. You know, I'd, I'd hop on like a, a week later, be like, okay, yeah, I weigh more or less the same, but I don't remember what I weighed last time. So I started hanging up this uh, sheet right outside my shower. So now every time I get out of the shower, hop on the scale, you know, it takes like 15 seconds, write down the, uh, the weight and body fat and all this stuff. And it's not like I'm, you know, this like anorexic, uh, <laughs> you know, body image guy, but um, it's just cool to gather the data and see what happens. So. Um, you know, here's just some readings from, I guess, way back in the day. And that's turned into, these are like both uh, front and back. It's about two and a half years worth of data that I just haven't even put into uh, a system yet, right? Because I know it's there and it's, it's kind of interesting, but I also am either like lazy or doing other things. And so at some point I'll get around into uh, actually putting that in and analyzing. But even just taking quick looks, right? It's like, oh, I've gained about seven pounds over the last two years. and body fat has stayed more or less the same. So I was like, hey, you know, that's not so bad. Um, so once I got on this kick, I started seeing like what other things I could personally measure about myself at any given time. So right now, if you saw me uh, when you walked in, I was kind of like fidgeting with this uh, like brosier kind of thing, but it's this uh, heart rate monitor strap and watch that I have right on. So this big honking watch um, is taking my heart rate right now. So it's 115 because I'm kind of walking around a little nervous. Um, and also like altitude, temperature, all this stuff, right? So it's a, they market it actually as a personal computer instead of a watch. This thing is, is a beast. It's not cheap, but it's pretty nasty. Um, and so it can generate some pretty sweet data when you just go do normal everyday things. Um, this is the client software they shipped with it that is pretty sweet. Uh, this is me just going for a 20 minute run around my neighborhood, something that I do like fairly frequently and would never capture. Now that I have the hardware to do so, I might as well do it, right? I don't think that anything particularly useful is gonna come out of this information, but just the fact that I can capture it 
is cool to me, so I'll do it. Um, so this is a little, actually, I'll go to the next one. A little more interesting just from the altitude side of things. It's cool to see that this thing really works. I can't wait to go take it uh, snowboarding this winter uh, because it'll be pretty sweet. It'll do your vertical speed and everything like that. But uh, you can see how just normal, like, kind of boring things turn into real computatable data. And I'm flicking around on things. But here, you know, it always takes me a while to actually get out of my apartment and uh, go hit the road. Then I run down this hill for a while. Uh, run up uh, some stairs, and you can see that the um, heart stuff is really pretty cool. I think that some more people should look into this body hacking. Um, there's there's a whole lot of stuff online, but you know it can be pretty dangerous. It's like overclocking your heart stuff. Um, that's not you know particularly safe, but um, you can see here right where I was kind of pushing it from time to time. I, I think like if you go over 170 beats per minute, you're gonna definitely be feeling it, and it's not even that sustainable. Um, so this is stuff that. I didn't even uh, like try to slow down. I just had to slow down and, and take a break. So at one point, I think I cracked. It was like 182, uh, like really just pushing myself. I think that you know, if I were a little worse shape, it would be a bad idea to be like running all these experiments on my heart just out in the middle of the woods. Um, but uh, you know, it's really cool just to see like you push yourself, you peak, and you're like, man, this thing's pretty sweet. A lot of us in here are big fans of complex systems and everything like that. Um, so, you know, the human body, number one, is just super, super complex. Um, so you should be really interested in that to begin with. Second of all, like your own, right? This is what you are working with every day, right? And once you're out of there, you're out of there. So it's really interesting to kind of, you know, get some benchmarks on where you are personally and even just track the stuff. I think that if you get enough of it, um, you can create a pretty good representation of what somebody's life, more or less, has been like. Um, and kind of model out at least some of the, um, you know, less of these like soft human skills or soft human characteristics, but just the fact like, hey, this guy was here, he was doing this stuff, he weighed this much. It's just really interesting stuff to gather all this data. Um, people that are worried about losing this data, um, I don't really know why, right? It's, it's terribly uninteresting to almost anybody but me. Um, maybe my insurance would be interested in this, but even then, uh, I don't know. If anybody can think of some good reasons why my like heart rate might not want to be leaked out, we'll talk in the Q and A. Um, so some of my friends uh, out in Seattle have, you know, kind of come to learn that I'm this weird data gathering kind of guy. So uh, <coughs> one of my buddies gave me this radiation uh, like gamma detector USB thing, right? So uh, I don't have it with me today, but because I think that. Just trying to get on the plane with a lot of these things is a little interesting, right? You have to like take off your like heart rate strap and then uh, you know try to explain the radiation monitor. I think that uh, it's a little strange, right? And we're not even at the best part yet. Um, but so, you know, this is more just like random shit. Like who cares, right? This is me waking up in the morning uh, and the radiation levels in my room. I don't know why they dropped down. This is just a 15-minute sample. Um, but you know, I guess I woke up brushed my teeth and became less radioactive as the day went on. <laughs> so, um, it, you know, just more cool stuff. It's, it's available and uh, if you think about it from like a, a world modeling concept, um, like if you haven't seen The Matrix, go see it several times. Um, and I think that may be where I'm ending up with a lot of this stuff. Like I'm gonna kinda recreate my own mini world and I have like, uh, you know, be playing The Sims with myself. It could be The Gyms. And now the, for the most fun part of the talk, um, and this has been by far the most popular data gathering exercise I've done, uh, but you know, blood alcohol content, really cool stuff. Um, so this nifty little product here is called the AlcoHawk. Um, it has do not drink and drive written all over it, although it says, you know, it comes in this nice little leather handy carrying case, uh, you know, <laughs> it fits right in the glove box, all this stuff. Um, but. You can see that there are a couple different types of people that um, buy this device, and this is going to be way too small to read. Uh, but I did want to squeeze the two types of people joke into my slide somewhere. Um, so the first group, right, <coughs> it's kind of like these data dorks like me that, uh, you know, they're going to be drinking anyways. They may as well try to gather some data on the fun that they're having <coughs> and uh, see what they can grab from it. And then we go down one more. I'm going to grab some water real quick. Yeah, 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 just water. I can even blow into the alcohol to, uh, <laughs> to show you. Um, 
and what we're doing here. So this guy, uh, you know, now uses it as a proactive kind of measure. So he got busted once through like a .173 or something like this. Uh, you know, pretty high. And uh, he's like, now I'm never going to do that again. I got the alcohol to save me. And then uh, towards the very bottom of the spectrum, this is a little bit of a sad story. Um, but th you know, these are the Amazon reviews, by the way. Uh, this woman is buying her second alcohol because uh, like her husband is an alcoholic and she makes him blow into it every day when he comes home from work. And somehow this thing you know, fell under the couch and broke and she's buying her second one. Uh, I think I know how it, but, you know, it broke the first time. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's just interesting to see the spectrum, right? You got like these dorks like me that uh, you know, drink and blow into devices and then write it down and like you know, run around the block and see if their uh, you know, heart rate gets affected and stuff. Um, and then you have these people that are using it as like a, I don't know, relationship maintenance uh, gauge or something like that. So let me see here. I think you're all familiar, right, with the XKCD comic as well. This is uh, Balmer's Curve. Yeah, give it up for XKCD. It's pretty sweet. Um, but as you can see, and uh, I've tested this a little bit. I don't think it actually works out too well with me. Um, but, you know, around like 0.1337 is when you're at your uh, maximum programming skill. Uh, after that, everything just tends to, to level off. Um, and so, like some data here, right? Um, most people, has anybody ever blown into a breathalyzer? Can I get, <laughs> maybe? All right. Well, it's actually, you know, more than your average, um, I don't know, population, uh, like a, as far as a representative sample. So I don't know if that means we have a lot of uh, criminals <laughs> in the room or just like uh, people with access to cool equipment. But, you know, you never really have an idea as far as what you're actually at until it's potentially too late, right? Uh, you shouldn't be drinking and driving anyways, but even, you know, drinking and operating heavy machinery perhaps is uh, something that might be a little more tempting to do. Um, so you can see here uh, just some data that I've pulled off my uh, fridge where I keep most of this stuff. Um, you know, a couple Heineken, out playing pool, I wait 45 minutes. I come home, I blow a .027, I believe. Yeah, and it's like, oh, that's not too bad. And, and then you try to, you know, some of my friends take this and extrapolate it out, so they're like, all right, I can go drink eight beers and drive home, it'll be totally cool. Uh, <laughs> I don't think that's what this is by design for either. Um, and then the, let's see, another time, I was at a Mariners game, I had three beers and I came home and I blew a .094, and I was like, wow, this is shocking. You know, I didn't feel that bad. So then I had to go recreate it. Um, you know, do it again, and there's a .072 the next time. So there's a, you know, there's a lot of variable uh, to be taken in account of too, right? Uh, I think, you know, if I eat a sausage instead of a hot dog, I'll lose a little bit. Depends on how hydrated I am that day, all this kind of stuff. Uh, let me see. Coors Light's not very high in alcohol content there. You can see that I found it was about like a pitcher, a little bit more. Um, and then, you know, just kind of drinking it over the course of the night. Got out there, blew like a .08. So, eh, you know, pretty reasonable. And then this last one, when I was really trying to push it a little bit, um, some of my friends were having like a competitive drinking game. And, uh, you know, we all drank pretty significantly uh, and with the intentions of blowing into the alcohol pretty much by the time we got home. Instead, everybody just fell asleep. Uh, so this is seven hours later when I woke up, I blew a point one two one. It's pretty significant, uh, pretty significant. So. Um, it's also good because, you know, I called my girlfriend and made an ass of myself, but I had the data to back it up to be like, look, I was legitimately very drunk. Um, <laughs> and she, you know, it just makes it a little bit more okay. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, I haven't really measured myself as far as like drinking beers and going out on an autocrossing course and seeing how many cones I run to, into or something like that. But uh, this is a coordination, uh, you know, oriented sport here. Uh, you know, be it as may, is not really that involved. But you can see, uh, this is the morning I woke up with the point one two one. I had a 9 a.m. Um, softball game. And so these are uh, batting average. I think I'm on the right and my friend's on the left. But, you know, we were pretty consistent. I think, you know, you can, there's this whole um, realm of statistics you can take with baseball and softball. But people are more or less consistent uh, over the course of different games. Uh, yeah, when I was legally drunk, I just couldn't hit the ball. And I think that just comes down to the whole coordination thing. It's pretty cool to see like that. So uh, with that in mind, has anybody been drinking today? And You know, like we are in Vegas, yeah? All right, so I have the alcohol with me. Um, 
And I'm gonna actually, so, give it away to the highest blower right now. So if I could get like five people. Uh, and I'll continue with my talk. This is a brand new alcohol. All right. And so actually, here you can grab a mouthpiece from around there. The one thing uh, that we're gonna have to wait for, you need to, Maybe like you can't drink a beer and then blow into it, right? Because it's gonna contaminate the results. So I guess if you if you don't have a beer in your hand right now, we'll let you blow first. Um, anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else that had a really rough night last night wants to test my uh, point one two one? No. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so yeah, I mean this gets to come home with you. All right, so the, you just gotta give it a really deep uh, from from the lungs kind of breath. And so I'd wait until this uh, yellow light stops flashing and then give it a go. Uh, and so I'll just keep on moving along as people are blowing, and then I'll announce uh, the results. Um, yeah, yeah, give it a shot. There we go. Let's see what we got. All right, very nice. So point oh two three. Not, you know, respectable. Respectable for, what is it, like just afternoon or something like that? Yeah, give the man a hand, right? <laughs> All right. If you have more mouthpieces here, you can just grab it. Uh, if you don't have a beer in your hand, it's let you go last if you've seen like the most recent drinker. Um, so this whole thing I'm trying to get out of this, right, is data awareness. It, like um, before you never had any idea really like, you know, what you weighed on a day-to-day -day basis, if you were putting on pounds or, you know, what kind of, um, you know, how drunk you are after a few beers. I think that I've really learned now um, after this feedback loop, right, you, you turn, you tend to, uh, you know, you run around the block and this thing that does my body uh, Fat percentage also takes like how much water I have, so how hydrated I am. So I'm at the point now where I can hop on my scale and uh, pretty much know what my body fat and uh, almost weight are gonna be when I step on there. So did you press this button? All right, cool. Um, so this is the same now, like whenever I have a couple beers and I'm feeling a little buzzed, um, I'm like, huh, I wonder what my alcohol level is right now. So last night actually I went out with these two guys uh, we did some pretty good drinking until about like 3 in the morning. So at 3.30, I blew a .087, uh, you know, which is pretty respectable for uh, having drank a good amount. And then uh, I didn't hydrate before bed, which is a big mistake. So I woke up at 7 and uh, blew a .02. So, I mean, not, not crazy, but it would have made my morning a lot more uh, enjoyable had I not been too tired and lazy to actually drink some water. And uh, the water, I'm saying the Circus Circus, not that good. Uh, <laughs> so... Anyways, a little tangent there. Um, so data awareness, right? The fact that I'm aware of this stuff now, right? Just gives me another kind of, um, oh, what do you got there? Zero. Ooh, all right, we have a, <laughs> oh really, all right. Well you, my friend, are, I don't know, good to go do anything you want to do. All right, you can just pop one out. <coughs> um, so yeah, getting back to awareness, right? Um, if you look at where we are right now, right, this is like the anti-awareness capital of the world. All Vegas is really about is just distracting you, like, you know, a bunch of hand-wavy stuff and just taking all the money they possibly can from you. Um, so, you know, some things that point this out. Try to find a clock anywhere near a gaming table. They keep the lights at the same level all the time to trick your body into think, you know, it's like, what is it, two in the afternoon now? Um, when it's really two in the morning and you've been gambling for the last ten hours. Um, what else is there? The uh, tokenization of your actual cash, right? People have been working for a while to get this uh, notion of like I'm working for money. Now we have another .02. Was the other one .023? I think it was, right? So you got a .0003. And it's a good thing I bought the uh, three-digit uh, accuracy model or else we'd have some problems. Um, but yeah, this abstract tokenization of your money just means like you're, you just see it as you're playing a game. You have no real awareness that uh, you're betting like, you know, your kids college tuition uh, or something like this uh, instead of just some stupid chips. Um, so the free drinks are a problem and uh, like you can definitely, I don't know if they, the pit bosses would uh, <coughs> let you bring the alcohol to a table or not, but they don't like you talking on the phone. They don't like you, you know, even like checking your watch. They don't want you to know what's going on in the outside world. All you should think about is putting your money on the table right now. Um, and then, you know, so they'll have like these chummy pit bosses, these, you know, scantily clad waitresses, all to be like, oh, look, we're your friend because you're giving us money, all this stuff. So, 
Um, <coughs> moving a little bit from the awareness to uh, kind of like the privacy security side of things, uh, which is, what do we got there? Oh, a one three, not bad. And then, yeah, this is the last one. I guess you may just have to brush it off. Um, and so my only request is that this makes it to the TCP IP drinking game at some point too. Uh, just a, or, you know, it should be passed around. Um, and so, yeah, now moving on to like data, what you do with this data. This is more stuff that's taking place on the internet, more digital to digital instead of any of this physical to digital uh, transaction or, yeah, moving, jumping realms. So uh, talking about data gathering, right, and this goes back to um, I talked a little bit about the, the AOL presence or anything that it'll give status on somebody. Um, you should be able to, if it's a one-time thing and you have access to it, there's nothing stopping you from storing that yourself locally. <coughs> so you can potentially have a local database that you maintain of everything all your friends have ever done online and such. Um, we got there? Oh, you got to repeat for some reason. I didn't like it. Um, so you just got to hold on. I hope you take it down. You got the PBR hat on and everything. I feel like you're the, uh, you know, the favorite. Uh, so, yeah, if you can, you can gather all this information on people. Um, yeah, it's just it's pretty cool stuff to do. I don't know how it'll, it'll affect your friendships and everything. I personally don't do this, um, but it, you know, it's just interesting to be able to mine what people are doing. So, this harvesting can be pretty expensive, though. Um, you know, if you pull down all this data that people are. Uh, putting out, we got anything? Oh, one seven. So we have a winner right here, my man. The point oh two three. Uh, very nice, very nice. Came out of the gate strong. Put up some numbers that held up. Uh, I gotta say, I'm a little disappointed though. No legal intoxication at you know DefCon at one in the morning afternoon. Um, but anyways, back to stuff that actually matters. Um, so this data harvesting can be expensive and, and really time consuming. A lot of the kind of big search engines and stuff will do this for you. I think Greg Conti's talk that's going on either next door, or I know it's at the same time, so I didn't like to, <coughs> competing with him was a little difficult because we're talking, at least this part of my talk is really similar um, as far as like ev all this data that's getting piled up on the internet, what's it gonna mean um, to you down the road? Um, and so this quick demo, I actually don't have internet on here, so I'm gonna skip over that and just keep talking. Um, but the best thing you can do, right, is just speak HTTP, like write your own clients, so don't mess with browsers anymore, um, just to pull this data if you're interested in it. Just speak uh, raw HTTP, parse HTML, grab what you want out there, and store it. Uh, so social networking, right, is, has a huge, uh, you know, component to all this. There's the social hacking social networking talk, uh, which is good, I, I caught it at Black Hat. Um, but at least, from my perspective, I keep stepping on that cable. Uh, you know, there are a couple big players here, um, and more or less everybody knows what they do already. Um, but the news feed in Facebook, right, when that first came out, it was a really big deal. Uh, a lot of people didn't like it. I saw that, you know, seeing, using the news feed, I could see that all my friends were joining these I hate the news feed groups, and they were learning about them using the news feed, so it's a little ironic. But, um, you know, people really hated it at first. The thing is, with any of these uh, kind of invasive technologies, they, they say, hey, you know, I guess you can opt out of it now and all this stuff. But at first they said, uh, if you don't want to have this, then just, you know, get the fuck off Facebook. And uh, people liked it too much. And, uh, you know, the users can really be worn down to just accept privacy compromises um, pretty easily, right? If you just offer enough cool stuff, um, people will give it up. So this is like the, you know, candy bar for the password. Uh, study that gets done every year and everybody gives it away or like you know the hot girl asks you for your password and you give it to her um, I think that you know the the bar is actually kind of low uh, when it comes to what people will compromise for usability so um, let me see and I came into the Facebook thing a little <coughs> on the late side um, you know I graduated 04 I didn't have it because I went to a small school <coughs> but uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to cough directly into the microphone. But, uh, you know, I feel like I'm an old crabby guy now when I say kids these days. But if I go back and I, uh, you know, go back to Boston or something like that, I hang out with some uh, college kids, and they're just totally embracing this, right? Everybody has digital cameras. You go out to a party. Before, you used to be able to do dumb things, and, you know, the legend would live on, as, you know, told by your friends and stuff like that. Now everybody's going to capture it digitally. 
and uh, it's not going anywhere, right? It's going to be there forever. So uh, I liken this to the Facebook paparazzi a little bit. Yeah, all right. So <laughs> that thing's going online somewhere. Um, and I, I should say hi to my digital audience, whoever's going to watch this uh, on YouTube or whatever, because it's getting recorded. Um, but yeah, so you go to a party now, and you're just trying to you have a good time, and everybody's just taking pictures of you, and you're like, dude, like just cut it out, man. Uh, but it's just the you know, I'm hanging out with these younger kids that are totally used to doing it now, and it's just the way it is. Um, also, it's added some, I guess, interesting complications to the dating scene in general, right? Um, people always have this problem now that wasn't existent before um, about the interrelationship struggle. Um, so on Facebook, right, you can be single or it's complicated, uh, and it's always with somebody else, right? So say you're in a long-term relationship, uh, it ends. Big move, right, is who's going to set their status as single first. Uh, you know, some, somebody's going to have some feelings hurt about that, like genuinely, which is really interesting, right, because this is one of those divides where it hops from the digital, or the physical to the digital, and then the digital back to the physical, right? Like your feelings actually get hurt because somebody changed uh, their relationship status. And also, you get into a new relationship, uh, then, you know, the talk starts coming, like, hey, how come you guys aren't in a relationship on Facebook yet? Uh, and, uh, you know, then it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> it's just a little, not exactly uncomfortable, but it's funny that this uh, kind of, uh, I don't know, totally abstract representation of what's going on in your life has come to mean so much, and even so commonplace, right, that non-techie nerds will, will uh, start asking you these questions. Um, MySpace, I don't, I don't know, I guess I do mean to bash them, but... Uh, yeah, they have pretty much more of the same thing. I think that a lot of people on there are actually a lot more willing to uh, just give up all the information you could possibly want, right? These surveys that go around in, in the bulletins, they're like, you know, when are you born, what's your favorite color, blah, blah, blah. And you know that just on the other side of this, some smart, or I don't know, some marketing guy somewhere is just loving it, right? He's just like, oh, just keep giving it to me. Here, just keep sending you stupid surveys around, uh, and I'm just going to take all this data and uh, either sell it or do something with it. Um, so persistence, how am I doing on time? Is it 1.37 right now, is that right? All right, cool. Um, persistence is more this kind of capturing that I talked about um, with, you know, digital photography will do it. Um, I'm kind of doing it right now and persisting, like I'll, I'll log, um, you know, like my workout I'm getting right now. But also, you know, like if I move up and down, my uh, altitude will change a little bit. Um, and it'll be cool that I can even play this along with the stream of the video, right, and you'll see uh, you know, probably when I goofed up, my heart rate went up a little bit. Um, it, it's just kind of interesting stuff. Um, but the thing with uh, kind of like this whole Web 2.0 and how was it like Times Person of the Year was you, um, is that all these kind of nodes are getting connected now, right? So um, just now, right? I think like a I don't know, handful of people have taken pictures of me just on stage, right? So before, maybe you'd get one uh, like corporate photographer who like that was his job to come take one picture of the thing, capture the moment now. Pretty much anybody can do it and does do it. And so you end up with just lots and lots of uh, representations of the same thing. And they're all more or less pretty true, right? Like if somebody photoshopped, uh, you, know, you know, like a beer in my hand or something like that, then uh, all these other copies of the same event would uh, work to kind of like bring out the truth. So let me see. Yeah, and so a little Wu-Tang quote here, you got, you know, what's been done can't be undone, son. Uh, so if you don't want something to be captured, uh, just don't do it to begin with. Um, but, you know, once the bits are uploaded to the network, uh, you know, in the worst case situation, you know, somebody's spying on your traffic, so they got it. Uh, your ISP is looking at everything they do, everything you do, so they have it. Um, you know, say, like, Facebook gets it. You're like, oh, that's a horrible picture. I don't want people to see it. You remove uh, the tag that, you know, indicated it was you. Um, I don't know. They, there's still a lot of residue, at least in their system, uh, your system, just tying it all together, right? So once it happens, it's pretty much happened. And if it's been captured digitally, uh, there's no finding it. So um, everybody knows, right, this is kind of like the time-tested principle that security through obscurity, a horrible idea. Um, I don't think people really thought about privacy through obscurity, right? Um, people are like, I'm going to uh, take all these naked pictures of myself, but I'm just going to put them on my hard drive, and that'll be cool. Um, but then you get owned, right? And then they end up uh, all over the Internet. So 
I think that the only way to really guarantee that, uh, that these kind of breaches don't happen, uh, or even the, you know the case where you post it on uh, you know like a lockdown. Uh, like Google Share, or, you know, some box you shared, even that will get owned at some point. Um, so if you really think that you can capture something and you know keep it from all prying eyes, uh, you're, you're kind of hopeless is my take. So, uh, you know, this is just a real quick, like if you, if you don't, if you want privacy, uh, either, you know, don't do what you are about to do and want to keep private, or, uh, you know, do it, don't tell anybody about it or do it, tell your friends about it. But you know, the more this information spreads, the more out of your control it's gonna be. And uh, you know, you just you just end up losing your control over it. So I think that jumps into like the sex tape era, right? It's what I think we're in right now. Um, and so these are Google trend results, and you can see the uh, you know omnipresent spikes there where there's no corresponding news articles, but this is when everybody jumped up to search for, you know, Paris Hilton online. What do you have? Kim Kardashian, right? Britney Spears, uh, kind of questionable photos there. But so Britney is a little bit different. She was famous first, but everybody else uses it kind of like a springboard into uh, celebrity. And so I think that it's interesting now. The problem is when everybody starts doing this, it's going to become a lesser, um, you know, uh, like a lesser of a phenomenon. So people are just going to be like, oh yeah, whatever. Here's another sex tape out. I don't even care. So it's going to get more and more extreme. Uh, as we go forward in society, right? I think people just tend to like water down their, um, I don't know, shock system. Uh, you start seeing too many things, you become really indifferent to it and you just need like to get one up a little bit more. Um, so, and this is, here's a dun dun dun. This is, uh, you know, what a lot of people are talking about here is who else is in between this, uh, these arrows that go between the computer and you. Um, and the answer is right, there are a lot of people. Let me see what we got going on here. So a little proactive stuff you can do. I like to call it data elusiveness. <coughs> is if you need to send something to somebody, right? So you say you have some pictures, you wanna send them to a friend of yours. Um, you know, a lot of people right now will just use webmail, uh, you know, email or anything like that. And what you don't realize is there's just a lot of residue uh, whenever you use any of these systems. Um, the copy, and I, this should have been an animated, but isn't. Um, but so there's you, there's your friend, there's the uh, the servers over there. It's gonna end up on a uh, remotely accessible host somewhere on the internet, probably forever, right? Um, so I think that if you are gonna send something to somebody, you should do it on your own terms. It doesn't take that much code to actually write your own little um, kind of like Dropbox, host it on one of your boxes and uh, just go from there. You can even write a client that you give to all your friends, right, that'll provide some encryption. So you say, that, hey, you wanna send me a file? Great, here's this uh, program to run. You know, they have to trust you to the point where they'll actually run your code. Um, but, you know, run this. It's gonna do a lot of, you know, secret, super secret stuff that um, is gonna encrypt it, you know, maybe obfuscate it a little bit, and then dump it directly over an encrypted channel to your box. Um, and so it really, um, ups the level of um, security in the system. I'm not gonna say that it can't be broken because uh, you know, my whole principle is that like, we're all kind of hopeless, so just don't do stupid shit. Um, but it will kind of like up the ante where people aren't just gonna accidentally um, get it exposed, right? With, with the uh, webmail example, a lot of people will use the same passwords all over the place. You log in, you lose it once, then somebody logs into your webmail. They go look at all your history, they see everything you've ever done. Uh, it's really kind of devastating if you are end up in that situation. So on top of that, right, just use uh, SSL almost everywhere, right, with this new DNS thing that came out, like that should scare you enough. Um, but everybody, almost everybody now will offer um, at least an SSL initial connection to like webmail, not necessarily by default, right? So opt into it if you can. Um, so here's just, this is a, you know, more probably very difficult to read text, uh, but it does sum up kind of everything <coughs> I've been getting at, um, it, like pretty well. So you have this couple out in uh, Washington, and you know, they ended up uh, getting charged for murder based on the phone history, you know, the text message history that they had exchanged between each other. So I think this first thing, I can't really read it here, but you know, they, they talked to the police and they said, oh yeah, uh, I didn't send any text messages to this girl. And the girl said, oh yeah, you know, the only thing that I got from him is like an I love you or something like that. Um, 
think this is the, I can't really see it, but the one thing I want to stress, right, is if the government comes and knocking to any of these people that host your data and have the residue, right, they're just going to sell you out like that. Because, um, you know, that's pretty much what they have to do. It's in their best interest legally, from a business perspective. You don't really want to fight the government. Um, so these guys thought that um, they could just erase the text messages on their phone. And actually in like a pseudo smart move for murderers, I guess, they sent uh, cover-up messages to each other that they left on their phone. So you know, they deleted the old messages. Then they started asking questions about the guy that they uh, bumped off. And then they, you know, when if, if they figured that their phones got turned over, they'd have like this uh, kind of like cover-up to show to the police. But so the, uh, uh, let me see, phone provider sold them out, right? They ended up going to jail. Uh, it was also interesting that the kind of like one of the bases, they were trying to kick this guy out of uh, the house who they were all living in, but he had some pornographic pictures of the woman uh, stored digitally or something like this. And it's just another thing, right? So they were fighting over control to pictures that she had taken in the first place. Um, you know, if you never had the data out there, it never would have led to that problem. So I think like data control is really, really powerful. Um, I don't know, I think people here get it pretty well, but I just, it's like one of my messages too, right? Data itself, very powerful, and then control of the data, and keeping it yours if you can is good. So I'm running out of time a little bit. Um, I talked about this moment in prime, a moment in time principle, um, but some places will show you, uh, like you know, instant messaging pr uh, platforms, for example, they'll, they'll show you somebody's current status, but they won't go back and show you every status that they've ever set in their whole life. So this is where it comes down to you just grabbing it if you want to and uh, maintaining a database locally. Um, personomies, uh, you can check it out, I think you just, just Google that. Um, but you know, they're the digital representations of self. So a lot of people will um, have to do a lot of monitoring on what their digital footprint actually is, right? So me giving this talk, probably gonna up some Google results somewhere. They're gonna tie me to DEF CON. Um, although Jim O'Leary, very popular name, and you know, kind of just you get usually a bunch of just white Irish guys, uh, of which I am one. So um, let me see, but you know, it'll just add a little bit to it, only in my just being here and having some web presence. Um, so data analysis is where it gets really interesting. This is where I'll host more stuff online, um, and I'll say it at the end, but I should say it right now. It'll be on, uh, and it's in the slides too, but like DL. Dot Jimio is J I M I O dot com and then slash D C O F uh, for DEF CON. I'll, I'll probably link it up, but this is where you can actually find some code on some fun things you can do with data. Um, so, and I would demo these, but it's more interesting actually to look at the code and look at the, the data sets. So, this first thing, uh, I called it can a brother get a? And I dropped this phrase, you know, this is like a pretty common cliche. Uh, I was looking for a code review or something at work. I was like, oh, can a brother get a code review? And I was like, oh, that's kind of funny. I wonder what else a brother may like. Uh, so I uh, wrote something that would just, you know, ping Google looking for that phrase and extract all the results. It's really pretty interesting. Um, so I'll put a link up to that, and the code's pretty cool. Uh, this for unlawful carnal knowledge. I'm a little bit in interested in uh, extracting not so much meaning, but a lot of like inadvertent things out of data sets too. So uh, this guy, and the code again is interesting, and I, you know, it gets a little bit long, uh, but it, it'll parse uh, news articles looking for instances uh, where, let me think here, so if you uh, take the first letter of every word in the article and put them all together, it'll look for instances of swear words. Um, all right, so for unlawful carnal knowledge, bam. Uh, and so that's a little interesting just because people will drop things in there. Uh, also interesting is the inadvertent haiku finder. Uh, so the same thing, it, it works on these articles, um, has a big backend database for not really natural language processing. I don't, I, NLP is misused right there, but um, you know, correlating uh, one piece of data to the words and then it looks for people that accidentally wrote haikus in their uh, articles. It's, it's pretty cool stuff. And so the links will be online for the code and the actual applications. But you know, it's, it's just totally useless, right? Who's actually gonna do anything cool with that? Um, but interesting. So <coughs> lastly, and this goes back to my first point where I'm just gathering all this data. Um, what do you do when you have all of it, this the physical to digital representation? Um, I think you can do some really, really sweet modeling as far as you know, what happens if I go back in time and make this decision instead of the other one? Um, I don't think we're there yet as far as um, like gathering all the data and even being able to project enough, but I think it's uh, kind of cool stuff. And also, 
um, going back in time, right? I, I bet most people in here maybe will blog or at least have something that they keep up to date online to react to events that are taking place in the world. So if you look back to uh, something like you know, Diary of Anne Frank, we got lucky, we found one person's um, reaction to like a, you know, a horrible situation, but even the fact that we found like one thing was really cool. Now that we have everybody blogging, um, you go back, you look at something like just the net activity on September 11th, it really just captures something that um, is gonna be super interesting to future generations, right? Like we're just putting so much of what's going on in the real world into the digital world, and I think as long as we can keep it um, which a lot of the kind of privacy people um, kind of poo-poo on, but I think it's gonna be there anyways, because once it's out there, it's out there. Um, if you can keep it, you can just do go back and you know, get a real uh, good sense of like what was going on, how people felt about it. It's really cool stuff. So, uh, yeah, so you know, just wrapping it up a little bit, the forecasting targeting stuff is what you wanna do when you get all this data pulled in. Um, providing, uh, you do it correctly, you can get a lot of benefit out of it. Um, and I think you know a lot of people are anti-marketing, anti-advertising, but I actually don't mind it if it's actually targeted to me and something that I'm legitimately interested in. So um, I don't mind kind of giving up some of the information in exchange for like better results. So with that, I think I'm running out of time. We'll give this guy his uh, Alcohawk, which he uh, you know won fair and square. I'll give you the box with this handy little leather case. And then uh, I think that's it. I'm going to end up in a Q&A room somewhere. So uh, thanks for your time. And uh, yeah, log everything you possibly can. Thanks.